Hello, this is Kathleen Ralph, creator of the webcomic Hope and Harry. I know how important support is for creators, which is why I support Andy and Derek and the Comics Alternative through Patreon. This is the Comics Alternative webcomics, reviews of Femme Noir, It Will All Hurt, and Freak Angels. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Web Comics. I'm Derek. And I'm Sean, and we're two guys with advanced degrees talking about web comics. And on this month's episode, Sean and I are going to be looking at three really interesting web comics. We're going to start with Christopher Mills and Joe Stanton's Femme Noir. After that, we're going to turn to an interesting web comic by Farrell Dalrymple, It Will All Hurt. And then we're going to wrap up with, I guess, what we could call a webcomics classic. Warren Ellis and Paul Dufeld's Freak Angels. But before we get into those discussions, we want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Web Comics is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some wonderful, unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials will be at 45% off cover price, sometimes at 50% off cover, but often the discounts can get quite a bit more impressive than that. And also have to point to, uh, to their sister site, MyDigitalComics.com, where you can download uh, digital purchases uh, for all for uh, DRM-free in both PDF and CBZ formats. Excellent format stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, plenty of good material there to, to choose from, uh, including, I just noticed, they have a book out there called Dracula vs. Robin Hood vs. Jekyll and Hyde. And on the concept alone, I have to say that <laughs> sounds pretty darn awesome. Uh, they've also got plenty of free downloads available for uh, t- trial runs if you want to take a look at some of their uh, uh, test pieces to make sure you like what you see before you actually pay for it. They have uh, previews of a lot of great comics there. So, mydigitalcomics.com. Also, they have a, uh, a purchase credit uh, towards your purchases at uh, DCBS. If you, uh, you're you in 5% uh, on your digital downloads against your DCBS purchases as well. That's right. Now, whether you like your comics in digital format or in hard copy, you can't go wrong with Discount Comic Book Service and its sister company, such as uh, My Digital Comics. So go to DCBService.com or MyDigitalComics.com for all of your comics needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that Sean and Derek sent you. And you know, Sean, another sponsor for the show also offers a great product, and that's coffee. And the place to go for your coffee is Just Coffee Co-op. It's a wonderful place to get not only coffee, but also tea and chocolates. All of their coffee is 100% fair trade, it's shade-grown, and it's it's organic certified. Everything is roasted to order in small batches. There is no mass production. And that is some fantastic stuff that you need for reading all the comics that we do. Keep you awake. uh, Keep you awake. Keep you caffeinated. Uh, But, you know, to be on the safe side, too, they do have decaf available as well. Just as tasty, but uh, without the caffeine if you have some uh, issues, uh, allergies, or anything along those lines. That's right. Now, if you go to their website, which is justcoffee.coop, that's justcoffee, one word, dot C-O-O-P, 
place your order, and then upon checkout, be sure to use the coupon code COMICS. That's C-O-M-I-C-S. That way you will get 10% off of your order. There is no minimum order, and shipping is free. And again, when you use our coupon code at checkout, COMICS, you get 10% off, and it helps the COMICS alternative. So that's just cuff, JustCoffee.coop. Go there, find out what they're all about, and you'll discover, as we already know, it's a great place to get caffeinated. Excellent stuff. Excellent right. stuff. Or if you don't like the caffeine, it's a great place to get decaffeinated, as you pointed out, Sean. <laughs> Something for everybody. Yes. Um, now, we got some great web comics to discuss for the month of February, but before we get into those titles... I, I want to talk with our listeners a bit, uh, and if you're a regular listener to the Comics Alternative, this will be the first in a number of times you will hear this pitch. Um, you know, Sean, myself, Andy, Andy, Jean, Gwen, Shay, everybody who works with us on the Comics Alternative, every now and again, we'll get into a conversation about our listeners. In other words, who are our listeners? Are they fanboys? Are they comic scholars? Are they male? Are they female? How old are they? Where do they live? What's the ethnicity? All of that. In other words, we want to know about our demographics. And we've decided to do something about this. In the past, when we find out about you guys, we've done so almost exclusively by you reaching out to us. In other words, telling us something that you enjoyed via email or maybe in um, uh, in a Facebook posting or on Twitter, you'll get in touch with us and tell us something, you know, I like that you guys did this or I, you know, wanted you to talk about such and such, but you didn't. In other words, you initiate the engagement and that gives us a little bit of information about who our listeners are, but it doesn't give us much. What we want to do, though, is to conduct a survey. Now, we're hosted by Libsyn, and for those of you who know anything about podcasting, Libsyn is really one of the two, if not the biggest, podcast hosting sites out there. Uh, And if you're interested in learning more about Libsyn, uh, their name is spelled L-I-B-S-Y-N, so Libsyn.com. You can go there and check them out. But we're hosted by Libsyn, and one of the great things about being hosted through Libsyn is that there are a lot of different perks that they provide, and one of those perks is a survey. So they have a survey set up for us, the Comics Alternative, and we are asking every listener to go to the website, the address I'll give you in a second, and fill out this survey. Go to survey.libson.com slash comics alternative. Okay, and again that is survey dot libsyn l i b s y n dot com slash comics alternative and you will see a very short survey and you'll know it's our survey because our comics alternative icon is there as well as a description of the show. Now, Sean, when I say a short survey, how many questions do you think a short survey would entail? I would think maybe six or seven at most, right? Six. Only six. And the Fancy. only – short is always better with a survey in my book. Absolutely. Now, yes. And the six questions deal with gender, age, marital status, ethnicity, education, and household income. That's all – and that's just not the questions we want to know. That's an automatic set uh, that Libsyn has for all their surveys. So they're the ones who determine that. So – It's just six quick questions, and also there's an area for you to put your email address. I strongly encourage you to include your email address for this reason. We're going to be running a contest, a drawing, uh, after we finish with this survey. And this survey push is going to be for a month, maybe two. And then after we finish with this survey, we're going to get, we're going to pull one email address from all of you who have taken the survey and given us your email address. And we've decided that what we're going to be giving away is a Comics Alternative t shirt. We don't have a Comics Alternative t-shirt yet, so some of you listening to this may be on your computer going to our website thinking, okay, I want to get one on my own without filling out the survey. We don't have them printed yet, but this year we will be printing t-shirts. I want to have them by Heroes Con, so that's this summer. But um, 
if you give us your email address on this survey, and you don't have to, but if you do give us your email address, you will be entered in a survey, and after we finish the survey, we'll draw one name, and that lucky person will get an official Comics Alternative t-shirt. Now, how cool is that? That sounds pretty cool to me. I yeah. might have to fill out the survey for myself. Yeah, because you, you, you listen to the show, too. Absolutely. And although, I don't have a t-shirt yet. That's true. So, although <laughs> I, I do have to say that all of our co-hosts will get t-shirts, so once we get them printed up. But, um, but there you go. Uh, now, I know that people may be a little uncertain about giving out their email addresses. I want to assure you that the good people at Lipson do not use this email address for anything. Basically, what they do is they receive all this information because the survey is there on their website, and then they give that information to us. So don't feel that you're going to get a lot of unwanted mail from Libsyn or from us. Uh, you know, we just want it for survey purposes. So again, go to survey.libsyn, that's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com slash comics alternative and fill out a quick survey. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll suggest, too, we don't actually have, as we're recording this episode, we don't have a link on the site currently, on our site. That's right. Uh, but I I'm, don't doubt, Derek, that you will have that up and running fairly short order, hopefully by the time this actually airs. Exactly. And I will put it up not only on the regular or the main Comics Alternative site, but also it will be in the show notes for the next, what, month or two, however long we're doing the survey. Because we want to get as many respondents as possible, because the more response we have, the more information we have about who's listening to the show. And that's really good to know. Yeah, we can absolutely. Uh, I, th I think that helps us a lot talk about, you know, uh, who we're talking to, right? We're, we're certainly going to speak a little bit differently if we know that everybody uh, is of a certain age group or a certain uh, education level or where we can uh, tailor what we're talking about and what books, uh, what comics we're looking at. Uh, based on that. Yeah, oh, or to a point. I mean, if we find out that our primary listener is 25 years or younger, you know, every now and again, I'll still want to talk about 1970s television. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, bring that up as a reference point. But but you're right. You know, The more we know about you guys, the ones who listen to this show, I think the better the comics alternative can be. So again, we very much appreciate it if you take the time and go to Libsyn or survey.libsyn.com slash comics alternative and take a very, very brief survey. With the possibility to win a t-shirt. That's right. <laughs> All right. Are we ready to talk about Femme Noir, then? Let's talk about Femme Noir. Now, this is an interesting webcomic. It's uh, created by Christopher Mills and Joe Stanton. And if you wanted to, let's say, follow along with us as we discuss this, you can find this at the website femme-noir.com. That's F-E-M-M-E -M -M -E dash, not underscore, dash, N-O-I-R dot com. So, Sean, uh, how would you describe this webcomic? Um, you know what? It's well, just based on the name alone, right? You're gonna, you know, this has kind of got uh, a kind of private detective thing going on, a very uh, dark and shadowy feel to it, just based on the name, right? It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's got the femme in there with the, you know, goes back to the whole femme fatale characters and whatnot, and the noir, obviously, the whole genre of film that uh, based on on that, uh, and. It, not surprisingly, that's exactly what it is, right? It's a it's a crime comic about there's this uh, mysterious vigilante lady uh, who is in fact goes unnamed. They don't even uh, they make a point of not calling her any any particular name or title throughout the story, um, and she just acts as kind of a protector of a city called Port Nocturne, uh, and she goes around solving crimes uh, and and figuring out cases that the police are having difficulty with. It's a very, uh, kind of a Batman-esque idea, I guess, only uh, the lead character is obviously this 
this woman uh, who, in, instead of wearing a cape and cowl and going all super heroic on, on people, she's more of a private detective type. Uh, no real super abilities, just a, a very talented, very uh, aggressive uh, crime fighter, I guess you'd call her. Exactly, and I'm glad that you mentioned the Batman-esque quality to Femme Noir, because initially when I read this, I, I didn't think of superhero comics. I thought, you know, obviously of crime or detective comics, mm -hmm. because it is a take on that. I mean, here you have Absolutely. not a, a femme fatale, but the woman is the central figure. I mean, this is the Sam Spade-type character. Uh, so it definitely deals with the classic crime narrative, especially noir crime. But I think the superhero twist is in the fact that we don't know who femme noir is, very much like Batman. So there's someone who is underneath this, so to speak, cowl, or who, someone who's in this costume. And her costume is straight out of noir narrative, right? So she has this trench coat. She has a fedora, and the fedora is usually down low over her face to where you can only see, only see part of it. You can definitely see her very long golden locks, and she has, uh, since this is noir, a cigarette. And she has a cigarette in a holder, right? And it's almost always in her mouth, regardless of what she's doing, mm -hmm. running or fighting, which, which is kind of funny. And the one thing, though, in addition to her, her long blonde hair, to m make her distinctively feminine is that she wears fishnet pantyhose, or fishnet hose. I don't know if they're pantyhose, but they're fishnet hose. Absolutely. Uh, so, I, so I mean, this definitely is a woman. So this is not someone who is trying to to go around fighting crime in noir getup in a general neutral in a gender neutral way. Uh, she's definitely a woman. She's definitely a female femme. Uh, and, and, but, but we don't know who she is. So there's the superhero take from this. Um, you know, when I initially read Femme Noir, there were two other titles besides Batman that immediately came to mind, and one was The Shadow. Sure. And and then the other one is Will Eisner's The Spirit. And I think The Spirit mm. – this is much more in the spirit of The Spirit because you do have a, a kind of mysterious character. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with Will Eisner's classic The Spirit, we we as readers know that The Spirit is actually Denny Colt. But those who are part of that narrative universe, with a few exceptions, do not know who the spirit actually is. And so for most of the people in that world, the spirit's identity is masked, so to speak, or even literally, uh, because the spirit does wear a mask. Now, with Femme Noir, people in this narrative world, created by Mills and Stanton, those characters don't know who Femme Noir is, but even we as readers aren't privy to that information. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting you bring up the, the spirit analogy, too, because uh, as I was thinking about it, you know, we're, we're given, as readers, we're given the name Denny Colt as the main character. Right. But we really don't know anything about him prior to his life as the spirit, right? We get, I, I, so if, I, if I recall correctly, there's, you know, a little brief introduction, like his last, uh, basically his last case before he becomes the spirit. Uh, so we get a little bit of that, but we don't really have much more than that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting twist here in that what Mills and Stanton are doing are essentially putting the reader in the shoes of any of the characters as well. They're saying, you know, like you said, no one knows who this is, not even the readers. Exactly. Um, and in fact, the, the first storyline, uh, of Femme Noir is all about a, another character who's trying to, who's like trying to figure out who she is and where she came from. Right. Uh, that that he, first story is called Blonde Justice. Right. Uh, and he's, he's got it narrowed down to three people, but it could be any of them. There's a strong case for each one. And, and he kind of goes through the motions of here's why it could be this person. But then again, it could be this other person as well. And exactly. Um, and he's a, what he's a newspaper reporter, right? The narrator, yeah. Blonde Justice. Yes. And, and he's trying to figure this out. And he basically, and what this does, I mean, this first story is basically 
the groundwork or the exposition uh, as much as we can get here of uh, of what this entire series is about and this narrator of Blonde Justice believes that it's probably one of three women in at Port no- in, who live in Port Nocturne. One is a chartreuse, uh, a lounge singer named Dahlia Blue. You know, a great noir name. Uh, another um, possibility is that it is the daughter of Port Nocturne's biggest crime boss. Her name is Vanessa DeMilo. Again, another great noir name. And then the third possibility, according to our narrator of that first story, is a young upstart journalist by the name of Laurel Lye, L-Y-E. Again, another great name. So it's it's one of these three, probably according to the narrator of uh, this this first story, but we don't know for certain. And as the other stories follow, and right now we have up uh, – um, six or at least five completed and a sixth uh, we're in the middle of right now. Uh, and more times than not, each, if not all of these three characters, Vanessa, Laurel, or Dahlia, they make some kind of appearance or there's some kind of reference to them in almost every story. But again, we don't know if one of them actually is femme noir because both reader and characters are completely ignorant about the woman underneath the uh, fedora. And I think what's what's interesting here, uh, or one of the many uh, many interesting bits here too, is uh, they're they're playing off the a lot of the uh, I guess tr- tropes that you'd find in the typical crime novel that would would have been written in the 30s and 40s, right? Your mm-hmm. old shadow or or green hornet or or what have you. Um, but they're they're putting enough different spins on them so they don't seem trite and and repetitive, right? The primary one being the fact that you know we we have a female character, right? That just right. Didn't, that really didn't happen very much back in the day, um, and especially and, a detective, especially a detective, yeah, especially the lead character, especially an aggressive one, right? Who's who's has her own agency, who has her own. Uh, skill set, right? She's not the dance. She's never really a damsel in distress at any point, uh, and in fact, uh, it pulls a lot of men out of the fire, as it were. Um, you know, doing a, kind of the reverse of what you would expect in a, in one of those old noir twi- uh, pulp novels. Mm-hmm. Um, makes makes for an interesting, um, I think, an examination of of that whole genre, right? And and all the tropes that we associate with that. And what, why are, you know, how, why or how they are set the way they are and do they need to be? Exactly. Now, we've referenced that first story already, Blonde Justice, but there are six that we have up so far, or five completed and the sixth is, we're in the middle of. And so there's Blonde Justice, The Dingus, Dead Man's Hand, Demon Bat, Killer in Steel, and the current one, Concrete Jungle, and there have been just a few installments of Concrete Jungle so far. Now, I'm mentioning this because I want to talk about how long this webcomic has been out, which is different from how long these stories have been out, and I'll explain what I mean in a second. Uh, The first time we have the webcomic Femme Noir, from, from what I could gather, is August of 2013, and that's when Blonde Justice started going up. And like I said, uh, you know, this, this continues to be published, so it's going to the present now. Um, however, this is not the first time that these stories have appeared, because some of the six originally appeared in a series coming out from Ape Entertainment that began in 2008, Femme Noir Dark City Diaries. And what both Mills and Stanton do is they indicate which story originally appeared where. So some of these, especially the longer ones, uh, originally appeared in Ape Entertainment's Femme Noir Dark City Diaries. Um, Another story, a shorter one, appeared in... Ape Entertainment's Cartoonapalooza, I think that's an anthology title, in 2008. And then at least one of these stories appeared in the comic series Femme Force, and that comes out from AC Comics. So, Sean, one of the things I find fascinating about Femme Noir, outside of just the fact that this is, I think, a, a really interesting twist on classic noir comics, 
is that here we have an example of a webcomic, not that went from webcomic to hard copy, but apparently something that originally appeared in hard copy, but now is coming out bit by bit, not all at once, as a webcomic. And, and that's different, very different. <laughs> Well, actually, and you know what? It's, you actually missed a step in all this, too. Um, although you're correct on all the stories, the character herself, I did a little research here, actually appeared as far back in t- as 2001 in another online comic. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, it was, it's, it's, a, I don't believe they're online anymore, uh, as near as I can tell. Uh, but there, it used to be on you know, a. You I think at one uh, point when I was digging around, I was going to say, when I was digging around at one point, I remember, now that you say this, I tend to recall seeing a reference to that, but I didn't search it out like you did. Yeah. It was a, it was a, a website called Supernatural Crime, uh, and they had a lot of just, you know, supernatural crime stories, uh, different fictions of, of various types. And Femme Noir, was, that's where that story first appeared. Huh. Or at least the character and the idea. Um, as far as I could tell, I haven't been able to verify this 100%. As far as I can tell, those stories are no longer online anywhere. Um, and I don't know if, you know, Mills and Stanton looked at those and said, yeah, okay, we're not really happy with this. That was a first go. It was a nice try, but, you know, we refined the concept and, you know, whatever. Or if they just never got around to it, or if there's some licensing issue, or I'm, I'm not quite sure hmm. on how all that got set up but the, so the, the 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 chronology really is that she appeared online first then got put in print in a series of news stories which are now being serialized back online huh now that is interesting that that's an even more interesting twist than what i was originally saying uh, yeah uh you know you know getting back to the hard copies i, I mean i do think it's an interesting choice to take something that is already out there, you know, even though it may be out of print, you know, you could probably find back copies easily enough at, you know, some comic shops, uh, mycomicshop.com. That's where I usually look. Uh, so, so places like that. But to take that material and then to put it back out as a webcomic, and not just – I mean, it's not as if Mills and Stanton have ju- just dumped everything. It's like, okay, we know that this stuff is out of print, but we're going to make it all available as a webcomic. No, what they're doing is beginning in August of 2013, they began putting out this previously published material in installments, giving us li- uh, these stories bit by bit, bit by bit, as if they were creating new webcomics. Yeah, I think it's a, an interesting approach to things because what they're doing, uh, is, from my perspective, what they're doing is they've put their book out there, they've generated some interest, and you know that was you know like you said, what was it two thousand eight that those books came out originally? Right. You know that's a few years ago. Time's gone on. They don't have those books out there now. They're a little harder to find. Um, so what do they do to generate interest? They can reuse the material that they've already done, mm-hmm. uh, you know, right? Keep putting that out there, serialize that without worrying about cannibalizing sales because they've, ass- they've essentially sold all the ones that they're going to sell, at least from a, a, a publisher's point of view, right? The publisher not going to do another print run of these at this point. Right. Um, so they're not cannibalized. They're, they're really in no danger of cannibalizing their sales, but they can still generate more interest. And then go back to another publisher and say, look, this is still, you know, people are still responding to this. People are still looking for more of this. Let's do another book. Uh, Or, you know, alternatively, they can take that and say, let's do new stories strictly online and then sell a book from that later. You know, they've they've got some options there. It's it's an interesting way to approach it from a marketing perspective, I think, uh, generating more interest for stories without having to do all that much additional work. Exactly. And, you know, it's not as if they're trying to pull a fast one over on the webcomic reader, right? By making this appear that by coming out in installments, as any webcomic would, a new one, that this is brand new material. Because they indicate with each story where it originally appeared. So they're being upfront with that. Mm -hmm. But uh, like you, I think that this is an interesting – maybe we can call it a business choice. Uh, And, you know, this could generate more interest in the character Femme Noir to where if they – if there's not um, 
enough clamor for brand new femme noir stories, then maybe another publisher besides Ape could go back and recollect all of the femme noir narratives after the webcomic is is complete. Or alternatively, they could take that uh, the interest they generate from this and go to a Kickstarter and produce something themselves. Yeah, there they you want go. To do that. Yeah, they've got a, it's one of the interesting things I, I like about web comics just generally is there are all of these different venues available, these options that you can that can, you can go down. Right. There's not a single business model that, you know, this is the way it has to be. This is the way you're going to make money online. No, that's not the case. Right. You, you've got you can do this. You can do that. You can do this other thing. There's this new option. Mm-hmm. Oh, hey, there's this Kickstarter thing we haven't even considered yet. Uh, you know, there's there's all sorts of directions that a creator can go uh, just in an effort to really just get their story that they want to tell out there based on uh, what their skill set is and what their interest level is. Uh, you know, maybe they're maybe they're not good at doing print, so they can go back to a publisher and have a publisher deal with that a little bit more. Or maybe that's something that they want to do themselves. You know, it's, you've just got a lot of options there. I like that. Yeah, exactly. Now, going back and looking at what they've put out so far, it it appears that they put out installments of the you know of various stories or uh, whatever story that they're on. On it, it looks about maybe to be not quite once a week. If and I'm looking at their calendar here, where you can go back and and click through to see. What they have, and so, for instance, the month of December from 2015, there are only two things that I see here highlighted: uh, December 2nd and December 9th that they put up installments. In January, you have something similar going on. They put up one on the 20th of January, and then another on the 27th. In November of 2015, they actually did come out with one every Wednesday. Uh, of November, so um, it, it it may not be consistent. It says at the top of the website updates every Wednesday, but you know, Sean, you and I have read enough web comics have, and been doing this long enough to know not to trust what the web comic <laughs> says, and because you know, life happens, right? Absolutely. Uh, so, and you know, we we don't hold it against creators. Uh, so, you know, this comes out if not consistently, then I guess maybe fairly consistently. Um. Now, I, I want to ask you about the content of the stories. You know, as I mentioned, we're into our sixth one right now, Concrete Jungle. Um, have you noticed or do you get a sense that there is any kind of evolution or change um, going from the first installment, Blonde Justice, up to the most recent one, Concrete Jungle? You know what? What I do see is there's a little bit more. It, it starts skewing a little bit more towards the fantastic. Yes. Um, and you know the the especially the the concrete jungle. At least the initial installments that we've seen so far. Uh, I got. Uh, I still get a very pulpy sense of the story, right? But it's it gets a lot more into instead of the just a straight up crime story, more the uh, like an adventure story, you know, like a Jules Verne or something, right? Uh, Professor Challenger is, you know, uh, going to explore the lost world or, or that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's this, uh, this the, the concrete jungle story is, there's, uh, I, we're still early into it, so I, I don't think I can give really anything away here per se, but, you know, she's, she's trying to help out. There's a series of murders of uh, a group of adventurers, uh, and explorers, uh, and she's trying to to solve the mystery before the last ones get killed. And as she's uh, encounters one of the, the one of the few remaining uh, gentlemen of this group, he starts to relay this story about their last adventure, where they went on some. It was kind of a Skull Island from King Kong kind of uh, adventure, almost right, mm-hmm. where there's these giant ants that are the size of houses and. And that kind of thing, and it and it really starts to get more into that adventure type of feel. It starts getting away from the the original, more straight up, you know, classic noir uh, setup that 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 it was at the start. 
Yeah. In fact, I, I wanted to see if you got that same feel as I did, and I couldn't agree with you more that the difference between the earliest stories and the more recent ones is a – I don't want to say a deviation from, but let's say a more of a mashing up of the noir – uh, genre or the crime genre and other kind of genres. Now, with mm. the first three stories, Blonde Justice, The Dingus, and Dead Man's Hand, I mean, those are, for all practical purposes, straight up crime noir, right mm-hmm. down the line, okay? Right. There's really nothing fantastical or unusual about it within the genre of crime noir. But then you get to Demon Bat, which is actually a fairly short story, one of the shortest, I think, that we have up so far. And it has some fantastical elements to it, as the name suggests, Demon Bat. But I, I don't think it's egregious, right? It, it's not out there with um, – it's not too sci-fi-ish or adventure, uh, like jungle adventure as we have with Concrete Jungle. But then with Killer and Steel, things to bec- get – a little uh, stranger, at least stranger in a more fantastical way. Uh, you have a scientist who is not necessarily a mad scientist. We have that in Demon Bat. But in Killer Steel, someone who is working on a prototype of a robot that he will – he's making for the U.S. military and a gangster who is very, very close to death ends up making his way to this scientist's lab, as fate would have it, and as we learn, forces that scientist to use his experiment in order to prolong his, the gangster's, life. So that becomes a little fantastical. Now, the most recent story, as you were describing, Concrete Jungle, yeah, things are getting a little um, unrealistic. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. I have no problem with, with genre mashing in this sense. It's just an observation that the earlier stories we have of femme noir are quite a bit different. And, you know, both of us notice that kind of genre-ish shift mm-hmm. as the stories progress. And, and, again, I can't help but think of the spirit because, you know, especially toward the end of the spirit's initial run, things did get a little fantastical and sci fi y uh, you yeah. know, maybe to the title's detriment, if you want to argue that. But uh, it became something more than just strict crime comics, uh, and I think we have something similar going on here with femme noir. Still good stories, though. Yeah, still very good stories. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of interesting. They're still doing a lot of interesting things going on. Um, but I want to point out too, even though they're doing some genre, a little bit of genre mashing, they're still kind of staying within the same. Uber, you might say, right? Uh, I, I referenced King Kong earlier, or Professor Challenger. You know, those are those are still kind of in that same ballpark a little bit. You know, they're that's the type of thing that was popular back in the twenties and thirties and forties, right? So, I think there's still there's still a validity in in which genres they're mashing up here. I think with right what the what the spirit ran into, particularly after Will Eisner left, is you know that went straight up sci-fi. He's you know had uh, you know this science fiction and space suits and you know astronaut stuff, right? That's which was very much beyond what the spirit was created in. Right. Um, and we haven't done that here, right? We haven't seen that in film in, in film noir. We're still seeing no shark has been jumped. No shark has been jumped. <laughs> that's, that's pulling out the '70s TV show references, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so. You know, we, we're still, you know, you saw the giant robot thing in, you know, the original Superman serials, right? You saw mm-hmm. uh, the giant monster creatures, creatures roaming around in, in, you know, King Kong and, and Lost World and some of those early pulp stories. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a, a, a Captain Nemo type character come through with uh, his incredible submarine or, or some kind of Jules Vernish uh, of type of creatures coming coming through, um, I think that all kind of plays into the idea that they're they're not looking at at femme noir as strictly just a noir genre comic. They're looking at kind of what was going on in the 1920s and 30s uh, from a fictional perspective. What what were people interested in? What were people responding to there? How can we adapt that to the 21st century? Right. 
Now, uh, you know, before we leave Femme Noir, uh, I want to say a couple things about the creators. Uh, I think Christopher Mill's stories are very solid, and so I really like the writing that he's doing here. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, coming back to a spirit reference, Will Eisner's spirit, uh, I, I really do like the art of Joe Stanton, and I would be interested to know if he had in mind, as he was illustrating Femme Noir, in his head, what Eisner was doing with the spirit, uh, because there seem to be similarities in terms of not just the colors and shading, but but also the panel layouts and mm-hmm. the composition. There just seems a, a quite a bit of an influence of a Will Eisner going on in Stanton's work, and if it's not, I'd be a little surprised. Uh, but but you know, this is I, I was looking him up. You know, Stanton, and you can find out on their their website, Femme Noir, about the creators. Uh, he did some work back in the seventies. Speaking of the seventies, on old Charlton comics, uh, he worked on the Mini Ghosts of Doctor Graves, as well as E Man. Uh, so and, and he's worked with uh, with Marvel as well, but I find it more impressive that he did work with Charlton, uh, you know, a few decades ago. So that's cool. Well, you know what, and uh, and I have to point out he is he's keeping pretty busy himself even today because he's he, this is the guy who still draws the Dick Tracy comic strip on mm-hmm. a daily basis. That's uh, you know the uh, the ultimate in hard boiled detectives right there. Um, you know, the going back to what was it, the thirties, right? He's still in on that environment on a day to day basis, still drawing uh the the yellow trench coat uh every every day. Yeah. You know, even though he has worked on Stanton has worked on let's say Avengers titles as well as some D C stuff like Justice Society, League of Superheroes, you know, he definitely has a solid hand, not only in crime comics, but also in mystery, you know, again going back to the mini ghosts of uh, Doctor Graves. Mm-hmm. So so you know, this seems to be, I would guess, a uh, genre or some genres that he is very familiar with and enmeshed in and and very adept with i might add yeah absolutely well sean you want to start talking about a completely different kind of webcomic, and this is uh, Feral Dalrymple's It Will All Hurt. Now, It Will All Hurt is part of Study Group, and listeners of this podcast, both the webcomic show and also uh, just the regular review show, should recall that Study Group is not new to the two guys with PhDs talking about comics, because we have talked about a number of Study Group titles in the past, and in fact... It may have been the episode right before you came on board, Sean, uh, when Andy Wolverton and I did an all-study group webcomic show. Mm. And so we looked at a number of those titles. But we looked at at, the study group at least once, maybe twice, I can't remember, in regular review shows. But It Will All Hurt is part of study group. And if you go to studygroupcomics.com, then you'll see all of the... Uh, the titles there, and the reason I'm giving you that URL and not the one for It Will All Hurt, because the one for It Will All Hurt is rather long. It's studygroupcomics.com slash main slash category slash title slash It Will All Hurt with dashes in between. So just go to Study Group Comics and do a search. You'll find It Will All Hurt. Now, normally... Uh, Sean and I will look at two current and ongoing web comics. In other words, by the time of the recording, they're still being updated. The story is not complete, and then one already completed web comic. Now, we talked about Femme Noir. That's ongoing with you know new installments. It will all hurt is actually a completed comic. Now, the third one we're going to discuss, Freak Angels, that's definitely over with. Uh, I have to admit. Th- I thought when I first suggested that we discuss It Will All Hurt, I assumed that it was still ongoing and that it hadn't wrapped up last year in 2015, but it had. And the reason why I thought it was still ongoing is that Study Group 
with a number of their web comics, they put out hard copies every now and again, single issues. And these issues come out, maybe they combine a couple of web comic episodes into one hard copy comic, and that these come out just as the web comic continues to come out. And a good example of that is uh, Zach Soto, the guy behind. Uh, one of the main guys behind Study Group has the Secret Voice, and the Secret Voice is still going on as a web comic, but its installments as a hard copy comic book are still coming out as well. My false assumption was that it will all hurt comic books are still coming out, therefore the web comic is still going on. But again, that was a false assumption. The webcomic actually completed uh, last year in 2015. So this began back in May of 2012, and it is organized into six parts as a webcomic. And if uh, you know you go to the main page for "It Will All Hurt," you will see these six individual. I don't. What do we call them? Sections, volumes. And- it's chapters, it's, it's weird because Study Group puts out chapters, but Study Group organizes their web comics in a way that's completely different from almost any other web comic outfit that I've seen. In that, okay, so you will have chapters in almost any web comic. I mean, a, a, one example would be, you know, we just were talking about Femme Noir, right? Uh, and their chapters, I guess, are individual stories. Next, we're going to be talking about Freak Angels. And I think they're called episodes in Freak Angels, but for all practical purposes, they're volumes. Um, or, you know, you can say really long chapters. I call them volumes because each of those were collected in book form, which we'll discuss later. Um, so within an ongoing webcomic, you can have different chapters or volumes. That doesn't mean that the places to find a chapter or a volume are necessarily broken up into different places on the website. You know, they just say, okay, this begins chapter or volume two, and we know that that's where chapter two or volume two begins. With study groups, a little different. So the Episodes or chapters are separated, so if you go to the main It Will All Hurt site, you'll see a link for each of these six. But also, one chapter, you scroll down. You don't click through. You scroll all the way down. So as, in this case, Feral Downripple, when he would update a particular chapter, I guess he would just add on to the page where he already had been adding to that chapter. And it's, again, kind of a different setup than uh, you find in, I think, most webcomics. Yeah, and I, and I have to say, I think that's, that's an unfortunate detriment to the readability of the comics. You um, think so? Yeah, I, it, cause, see, because it wasn't too bad. It wasn't, it wasn't too bad for me going through this time reading this as a completed comic, right? Because everything's done. I know I can go, you know, when I get to the bottom of the page, I'll go back to the, the next chapter or the next part or whatever, start up again. But if I were reading this as it was being published, I'm going to go to the same, I'm going to go to this page and read the first installment. And then a week later, I come back, go to that same page, and you have to scroll past the first installment to read this new installment. And then a week later, you have to scroll past the first and second installments to read the third installment. So I think if you're trying to keep up with this on an ongoing basis, I think it becomes increasingly difficult and challenging as a as a regular reader. Um, and I don't know, that might be intentional. It might be uh, their way of kind of forcing readers to read, uh, you know, completed chapters or or you know, volumes or whatever, whatever they want to call them, um, as opposed to keeping a, an ongoing, more serial nature. I think, um, and, and we'll get to the story here in a bit, but what particularly with It Will All Hurt, you know, I think it would be a very difficult story to read, you know, one installment at a time, right? It's, it, it's one of those that doesn't have, you know, a nice, uh, like a, a regular punchline or a, a dramatic break every, you know, 10 panels or, or something easy like that um, to to end on. So I think it would be very difficult and challenging to have read this as it was being released. 
Yeah, uh, you know, and what you say about it could be a conscious decision in you know th- that there's a reasoning behind this format or the way that they lay out the web comic. And having readers have to scroll through or down, I guess, a page in you know of the previously published stuff in order to get to the newest stuff. And in one way, one reason behind that, as you pointed out, would be so that readers would come to see the completion of a chapter as a whole, right? So it's not mm-hmm. a series of discrete um, – posts that you click through to get to, that you see everything laid out. You just have to scroll down to see everything, and that's visually coherent, right? It's a Mm -hmm. chapter. I think maybe another reason behind doing something like this, and I could see this as a potential plus for many, is that by scrolling down the page and looking at or potentially looking at, again, installments you've already seen – it's a way to refresh your memory so now that you know – you don't have to go back and click back through. You just have everything on the page. You just have to scroll down to get a context for the most recent uh, contribution to that chapter. I can see the reasoning behind that. But but this is the way that study group comics, their web comics, are actually organized. And I mentioned earlier Zach Soto's The Sk- Secret Voice, which we discussed uh, on a previous web comic show. But we also discussed uh, Francois – uh, Vignol's Titan, and it's the exact same thing. And in fact, every webcomic at Study Group is arranged this way. And you say that you don't particularly like that format. Well, I don't. I don't care for it uh, within the webcomic format. Uh, if I'm trying to, like I said, if I'm trying to follow something on on an ongoing basis, it's current and ongoing. Right, as current and ongoing. Um, I, I I would get frustrated having to scroll past all of this material that I'd already read to get to the new stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, I, I would much rather, you know, go through, okay, here's just the latest installment, you know, whether that's one page or, you know, three panels or six pages, whatever it is that they're with a regular installment is, I would rather get that as its own chunk without having to sort through everything that's come before. I see. You know? Okay. Um, I think that, you know, especially, uh, with, I don't know how all of these are set up necessarily, but with, like, It Will All Hurt, uh, they're, the individual chapters are relatively long. Um, and if I was trying to get to the latest installment, you know, the last installments of this particular chapter, and I'd already read everything else, I've got to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll before I get to the you know, the last, you know, whatever it is, six or eight panels or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that would, that would be, uh, not, I don't know. It would have to be a make for a really good comic for me to put up with that, frankly. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, let's talk about, uh, the, the content of it will all hurt and maybe we can begin by describing or reading what they have listed as a brief description of It Will All Hurt, and this is on uh, the study group side. It Will All Hurt is a weird, sad, silly, and sketchy fantasy adventure strip with magic and science fiction and some fighting action. So does that sum it up? I don't, you know, as much as you can sum this one up. <laughs> it's, it's, this was, it was, uh, you know, you and I talked a little bit earlier, Is it, this was a very different and unusual kind of story uh one that was uh i think we both said we we had we were a little challenged by at least uh, particularly in the earlier installments on just what exactly was going on there um it's uh it was one of those that seemed to have there was there was very much del ripple has a has no problem doing the any sort of panel to panel transitions right as i'm reading through i could clearly see okay we have a character here they're moving over here they're doing this they're following that they're saying this whatever i had no problems with that but in terms of getting a sense of what the overall arching story was and what the point of what we were trying to get to was uh that that was a lot more challenging i think to try and uh pull out of of what he was doing yeah do you think that things start to become a little clearer that elements start to pull together as you get into this webcomic let's say by the time we get to part three they certainly are becoming they they do get more cohesive and more clear as you go along um 
I I wonder. I don't know though that it still was. At least for my purpose, I still don't know that it ever became as concrete as I would have liked. It's mm-hmm. um, it very much had the sense of. Uh, does he actually use surreal anywhere in the description? No, he does not. Um, yeah. it, but it does get sur- a little surreal in places. And a little surreal. That's putting it lightly. <laughs> and it has a very dreamlike quality to the whole thing, right? It's very much, uh, there's a lot of, I, I think, of you know things that just kind of appear and are seem strange to us as readers, but all of the characters take it as just a completely normal happenstance. Um, you know, the the one character is able to change to a squirrel and back, and that's just her thing, and she does that, and everybody's just like, they they I express enough surprise that they don't seem to have seen that before. That's not a common occurrence. Right. But at the same time, they're not phased by it at all. Oh, yeah, you turn into a squirrel? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And basically what we have going on here is this group of, I guess we could call them adventurers, and about all of them are young. So, you know, it's a group of young people, and each of the young people has some kind of power, ability, or at least some kind of defining characteristics. Uh, now, you mentioned the the young girl who could also turn into a squirrel. There is uh, – oh, what is the robot boy called? Uh, I can't remember his name. Drawing uh, a blank but, on his name. But, but he is uh, – you know, his his distinguishing feature is that he's a robot. And so each of these characters have some kind of ability or distinguishing characteristic to set them apart. And they're fighting this uh, evil force, this, this wizard that they're trying to, uh, you know – I, you know, just put him down to to where he won't hurt them or affect their lives anymore, and, and that basically is what it will all hurt is about, or at least what is happening here. Now, along the way, they encounter uh, a variety of different creatures, and who you know, some of which become or some of whom become a part of the crew. Uh, you know, one is uh, I think you know a cat uh, that becomes a member of this group as well, mm-hmm. uh, and in fact, the cat functions as a narrator. Uh, to much of it will all hurt, uh, or at least at one point he becomes a narrator. Uh, but he also is a character who we can count on for running commentary uh, every now and again, and and it is kind of strange. Now I was asking you when things started to at least begin to come together in a somewhat cohesive way, and I know I'm being tentative here. I think for me it was around part three, maybe even into four. I remember being a little confused and honestly a little frustrated with the first couple of parts because I wanted to understand what was going on. But by the time I got to part three, I think things started to come together a little bit more to where I could begin creating a story, some kind of story cohesion in my head. But I think at the same time, by the time I got to part three, I had more or less resigned myself to just reading the webcomic, not necessarily agonize or worrying over whether something to make, make sense or not, and just go through the process of reading in hopes that things will begin to come together. Mm. And I think that once I started doing that, in other words, I, I, I not that I became more of a passive reader, but I became a um, less agitated, uh, a less anal retentive reader, <laughs> and just, just let the story go and see where it took me. I think once I you know, got into that, uh, you know, mindset, things started to make sense more. Yeah. You know what? Now, that, as you mentioned that, that's uh, more or less how I approached it too. Um, the, the, I think one of the things that, that helped as well is that, um, the first chapter, uh, two chapters really are all about introducing the characters, right? That that's kind of how every story is going to work. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but what, what made it one of the things that made it challenging was that Dalrymple was introducing all of his characters, which there are there are, there are a number of them. We'd have right. what like six or eight primary characters, um, or what could be considered primary characters. He introduces all of them individually. None of them seem to know each other at first. Um, so he does that in a series of little vignettes, basically, and he'll spend four or five or six panels on one character, then switch over and spend another four or five, six panels on a totally different character. And there's no relation between the two. Um, And then he does that until they start meeting up. 
and they start kind of their their lives start intertwining and overlapping, and their adventure kind of becomes one as all of them. Um, and I think that that was part of the problem I had at the outset was that he the way he introduced all the characters it wasn't just okay we're following this one character oh and they meet somebody else and that person joins them on the adventure oh and then they meet somebody else and they join on the adventure as well uh, it was here's this person then here's this person then here's this person and then here's this person and then here's that first person again mm-hmm. here's a new person you know and and there was no there was no uh, there's no reason to necessarily uh, know why to follow any one of these people is they were all just doing their own thing and just kind of wandering about. And it was only until it was only after they started getting together and meeting each other and forming this group that they started to have this cohesive uh, narrative that, that kind of was easily navigable and followable as a reader. Right, yeah. When they got together, things started. I mean, they they got together in the story, and so once they were together, the story started to come together. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and you know, then we get to see them on their way to fight. You know, as I mentioned, the Red Wizard, and he's the the big bad in uh, this narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I don't know if you had a favorite character. We've talked about you know the the difference in many of these characters, and and they are quite out there i guess but did you have a favorite one you know honestly i'm going with the uh, the cat um gato is grigato i think Gri- yeah is. grigato yeah um in part because it not not necessarily because he was uh like like you pointed out kind of a narrator almost um but more because he had the he seemed to be the most grounded mm-hmm. um and the most matter of fact of of the characters he would just uh is basically able to say okay well here's this happened that means we need to do this uh or that happened that means that this other thing will happen or we need to follow up on or or whatever he seemed to seem to be the most uh reasonable and logistic of the characters Uh, the others seemed a little bit more flighty i guess for lack of a better term yeah uh and and just kind of um, a little too passive, I guess, and a little too in the, in, in I don't, I don't want to say that they didn't have their own agency. Um, but they, they didn't seem to be as directed, I guess, of characters. They were just kind of going along and that's the thing. And here's, we're just doing this and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, my favorite character and, and it's because of the visuals is actually the one beside the red wizard, the one grown up uh, in this story who, who is a significant character. And we know he's a grown up because in the last section, the last, if you want to call it chapter, uh, when this character leaves, one of the group says that guy was sort of cool for a grown up. Uh, and, and this is the man, and I don't know if we ever get his name because they don't use his name in, in, when he leaves at the end. We call him that guy. Uh, he he's a, a man with another little man growing out of his head. You know who I'm talking mm-hmm. about? Yeah, yeah. That's I, I mean, I don't think he's named. Yeah, visually it's freaky as hell. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that little creature. It growing out of his head is kind of spooky looking. Uh, now the man himself, whose head it's growing out of, you know, he—I mean, I guess he looks fairly normal for this world. So, but uh, the little creature man growing out of his head is really on the creepy side. But I, I just like that arrangement, you know, that a little man is nestled in or growing out of another man's forehead. And so there's just something strange and disturbing in a fun way about that. And that leads me to one of my favorite things about Dal Ripple's It Will All Hurt. I mean, we were talking about his story at times being difficult to wrap your brain around, uh, but the visuals are what really drives this story, along with a sense Mm. of humor, I think. Uh, And there's heavy doses of that throughout. But I, you know, I normally love Feral Dal Ripple's art. And if you're a fan of Down Ripple's art then, and you're not familiar with It Will All Hurt, then you definitely have to check this out. Because I think this is Down Ripple at his best uh, in that not just his representation of characters and also other elements of the story world, but how he illustrates the transition 
including text, between and among panels. Uh, sometimes you will have a certain visual component of one panel kind of falling out of it or maybe bleeding into or falling into another panel that helps guide the reading, even though you really don't need a guide you know, from the author about where to go next yeah. in terms of reading this comic. Um, but I, I think that gets into also its sense of humor that Dalrymple is having fun creating this and he's having fun creating this as a comic because he's using a lot of comic tropes and kind of bending them and playing around with them. Uh, and, and not just in terms of action, but in terms of the reading process, right? How he lays out everything, the panels, the visuals within the panels, and then sometimes bends those rules. And I really appreciate that. And all of this utilizing that wonderful Dalrymple art. Yeah, I, I agree. The the art is absolutely fantastic. And I and I half wonder, you know, I mentioned earlier that I had a few problems with the, the story, following the story at the start. And I half wonder if he started creating this as an experiment in the art itself and then only two or three or four chapters into it started to realize how he could pull it together as a cohesive story mm-hmm. um and you know that the i wonder if his whole point of the story of the creation of this was just to do this playing around with the art itself which is as you said is absolutely uh, gorgeous throughout the the whole piece yeah. You know, along with this, and this is something that you and I were talking about before we started recording this episode. Um, now, you said you hadn't read it, but back in 2014, Down Ripple published The Wrenchies. In fact, mm-hmm. you know, that was, for me, one of the best books. I don't know if I listed that within my top 10 of 2014, but it was definitely up there. Maybe an honorable mention. I can't remember, but it was one of my favorites at that time. That came out through first, second. Now, uh, It Will All Hurt was created between 2012, May 2012, and March of 2015. So it seems to me that Dalrymple was working on It Will All Hurt around some of the time that he's working on The Wrenchies. And the two stories are not entirely dissimilar. Uh, in bo- And it's been a while since I read The Wrenchies, and in fact we had Dalrymple on the show right around the time that it was published, and that was a fun conversation. Um, but it's been a while since I've read it, but you know, with The Wrenchies, just as with It Will All Hurt, you're dealing with a group of young adventurers, and the young adventurers are fighting some kind of nefarious force in both stories as well. And it also has this uh, kind of strange, surreal story world um, that the characters are inhabiting. And so it strikes me that these two stories have a lot in similar. What I'm wondering is, and in light of your comments about the art as play space for Dalrymple, Mm -hmm. if maybe Dalrymple was using It Will All Hurt to play around with his art that he was also working on in terms of the Wrenchies, or maybe even vice versa, maybe um, using It Will All Hurt, which is a much less cohesive story, uh, as a way of exploring certain directions that he could go in the wrenchies it 's entirely possible um, yeah, that 's one of the interesting things about any creator working on multiple projects simultaneously is as how does one influence the other uh, in which direction or both you know um, i 'd be curious to go back you know going back to femme noir we were talking about earlier i 'd be curious to go back and see uh, and compare the femme noir stories that were being told uh, as they were originally written with the Dick Tracy stories that were, that Stanton was doing at that okay. same time, you know, Good and point. see if there yeah. were any interesting similarities or overlaps and ideas there. Um, and I could, like you said, I haven't, I haven't seen the wrenchies. I have not read that, but it would be interesting to make that comparison to, you know, pull these up side by side and, and compare the two of these as well. Hmm. Uh, but even though you may not be able to wrap your brain completely around It Will All Hurt, uh, it's nonetheless, uh, I think, a really interesting webcomic. It's, it's, it's visually lush. You definitely have to check it out. And if you go to studygroupcomics.com, you can quickly and easily find it.
Well, Sean, yeah. you and I are talking about quite a number of web comics. We hope that we're not putting our audience to sleep. But if you are <laughs> getting a little drowsy, dear listener, I know how you can get caffeinated, and that is by visiting the website of one of our sponsors for this episode, and that is Just Coffee Co-op. Remember, all of their coffee is fair trade. 100% fair trade, shade grown, and organic certified. If you go to their website, justcoffee.coop, and put things such as coffee, teas, and chocolates into your cart, be sure to use our coupon code, COMICS, and that gets you 10% off, and it also helps the Comics Alternative. So that's justcoffee.coop. It's a great place to get caffeinated. So now we can turn to the third webcomic that we're looking at for this month, and that is a fairly famous one. Uh, this is Freak Angels, written by Warren Ellis, with art by Paul Dufeld. Now, is it uh, Dufeld? Is it Dufeld or Duffeld? I assumed it was Duffeld because of the okay. double F, but okay. I've never heard Duff. it actually pronounced, though. Okay. Uh, now, this began in 2008 and wrapped up a few years later in 2011. I don't know exactly what months it began and then ended. It just says on the website, you know, it ran between 2008 and 2011. Do you know exactly what month it started? Uh, I believe it was February 2008 and okay. didn't end till like, uh, middle of 2011, I want to say August. Okay. Wow. Now, were you reading this when it originally was being published? Yes. Or serialized. Okay. Yeah. So were you on board from the very beginning? Yeah, because, you know, you know this was um, this was a big comic at the time because this was one of the first comics, first web comics, I believe, that was being done by a print creator of, of note. Um, now, it's not to say, I don't want to say it wasn't, by no means was it the first web comic by a guy who also did something in print. Not the case. Um, but with a name like Warren Ellis... That's he, big time. That's a big name. And he was the first kind of really big name to 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 make the jump into webcomics in any capacity. And I recall at the time, that was really the, the first instance that a lot of the big uh, comic book news sites started covering webcomics in any capacity. is because Literally because they saw Warren Ellis was doing something in it. In fact, that's I wanted to ask you because you know you're much much more of a web comic critic and scholar than I am. I mean, I, I just feel like I'm dipping my toes into it. Um, but uh, so, do you feel that by Warren Ellis doing Freak Angels, this really did bring a lot of more serious attention to web comics and maybe even uh, something like a shot in the arm to web comics as a whole? Um, you know, I don't know that it. I don't know that it gave a shot in the arm to web comics as a whole. There was already a lot of people doing some really great stuff at that time. Uh, it's some of them for literally decades at that point, right? Um, but what he did, what he did, and what I will give it give Freak Angels credit for is drawing a lot more attention to web comics uh, and giving it a legitimacy to other mainstream uh, comic news outlets that otherwise had been dismissing them. Um, right there, there had been web comics that had, for years, years and years before. Uh, there had been very good web comics for years and years before. There have been professional web comics for years and years before. Right, people who are actually actively making their living doing web comics before Freak Angels came out in two thousand eight. Um, so, in a lot of so in a lot of cases, Freak Angels did absolutely nothing new or groundbreaking. Right in in that sense. Right there were. All of those things were already covered, but the, like I said, it, it brought a name and recognition that a lot of people had dismissed before. You know, I think there were a lot of people who were looking at web comics, saying, "Oh, yeah, that's a nice little hobby. That's fun. Yeah, very good," um, and just kind of dismissing it entirely. But they see a name like Warren Ellis, uh, who you know obviously has a even at that point had a slew of great credits to his name. Right, um, they see that and they say, "Well, wait a minute. If Warren Ellis is doing this, man, this might mean something. This might be significant." And I think that's that's when we started seeing, you know, your comic book resources and newsaramas and and those types of websites start looking at web comics as an actual thing that needed to be covered from from time to time. Yeah. Um, 
Now, I don't want to. I don't want to suggest that by saying, you know, I use the phrase "a shot in the arm" for web comics. I, I, I wasn't insinuating that before this that there wasn't a lot of good web comics, you know, oh, sure. uh, being out there that people hadn't been doing this. But what I meant was that it was a shot in the arm, not just for the critical attention, because I think that, that's a big point uh, as well uh, that you made, uh, but also um, a shot in the arm, as I put it. Or maybe a not a turning point, but a critical point for the platform, because yeah, people had been use, utilizing the platform as a delivery of uh, you know comic narrative before, but now that you have someone with the name recognition of a Warren Ellis, I would think that that would draw others, both big and also you know smaller names, to web comics as a way to put out material that. Mm. You know, af- that basically what Warren Ellis did was nothing new, but given his background and given who he was, for maybe many creators and maybe well established creators, that was something almost like a go ahead. It's like, hey, maybe I can do this as well. And so then that helps to enliven the platform even more. Now, people who had been doing it for years may have, you know, be thinking, hey, guys, we've been doing this for years and years and you right. haven't really paid attention to it. So I-, I can see some kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, a backlash there, but or potential backlash, but uh, th- the name of Warren Ellis doing a web comic, I would think, would kind of enliven in a different way, maybe not a better way, but a different way, the platform of web comics uh, in a way different from before. Uh, yeah, I, I see where you were going with that. Um, what you maybe know? What I'm I, off here. Well, you know what I haven't, I have not done uh, personally is I've not gone through and really studied. To see how many like print creators started going over to the web at that point, mm-hmm. um, I can only honestly I can only think of a handful that have. Uh, you know, Mark Wade is is the big one that springs to mind. Um, With Thrillbent, yeah, exactly. Um, and there's a few others. You know, that he's got uh, a handful of folks. You know, in the the Thrillbent uh, umbrella, I guess you want to call it that. Uh, that were all print people beforehand too. Uh, but there are not a ho- whole lot of others out there uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, and those that are tend to be like the, the, the Mills and Staten that we were talking about earlier, going, you know, just bringing this full circle for the whole episode, right? Um, they, they had a comic that was published, and now they're serializing it, right? Mm-hmm. I, I have seen that in, in more cases than uh, someone who created something digitally with the intent of putting it out digitally um the the other i guess the one caveat to that is i have seen a few people who have uh put together a a book or a graphic novel and then the publisher decided hey let's go ahead and serialize this um and i want to say oni has done that and i want to say first second at least once um where they had they basically had a book deal with with a creator uh and the creator turned in all his work and said hey this is great you know it's been edited and it's been it's ready to go to print uh and then they start serializing it online in advance of the book being published itself i have seen that what with first second was it shadow hero <sighs> Because um, I know that was put out in, in digital format, not as a web comic, but as in digital installments. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it wasn't. Um, what was it that they did? Um, I am drawing a blank off the hand, off the top of my head. I know there was. I, I'm pretty sure there was one or two that they tried. Um, I was just curious. This no. Yeah, no. I'd, I'd have to go back and look. I want to say it was. It was something by a name creator, like a Faith Aaron Hicks or somebody. Um, okay. But I would have to go back and look. I don't recall off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, but um, Freak Angels could just well have been just a regular uh, monthly comic book out fr- coming out from Avatar because mm. Avatar is the one that you know published the collections, the volumes. 
and, and in fact, there are six volumes of Freak Angels, and you can even get a collected edition, a boxed edition with uh, all six of those. And, you know, you can you know go to Amazon.com right now and get them. And, in fact, if you do choose to go to Amazon.com and get a hard copy of Freak Angels, then go to our website link, uh, comicsalternative.com slash Amazon, and click through – our Amazon Associates link, and we'll get a few cents if you want to buy copies of Freak Angels or anything on Amazon, for that matter. So, okay, I had to get that little, uh, you know, associate pitch in there. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, these uh, these are out now and still available from Avatar, but they could have come out as a regular ongoing comic book series, a monthly, but they chose online. And, mm-hmm. you know, th- this does have... And the reason I mentioned the the monthly comic, this does have a monthly comic book feel to it. Uh, I mean, not all web comics do, and you and I have discussed this in the past. There are some web comics, and you know, in many ways, there's nothing wrong with this that don't seem to have a, a as clear a chart or a, a as clear a course charted. Uh, mm-hmm. Where you get a feel that the creator is maybe meandering a bit in order to get a sense of where to go or who a character is, or maybe even basing some of their decision on audience response, right? And then after they get a sense of things, then the narrative trajectory becomes a little more solid, com- becomes clearer. But with Freak Angels, it just strikes me that this it has a clear direction almost from the beginning. Now, much of this uh, is probably due to the fact that the writer is Warren Ellis, right? You know, an mm. old hand at creating stories like this that are intriguing, cohesive. Uh, but this could have just as well have been a monthly comic, although it wasn't. It was a web comic. Uh, but it, it reads really well. I have to tell you, this is one of the most enjoyable web comic reads I've had in a long time. Well, it's. I think a lot of that goes to the fact that it's Warren Ellis. You know, I'm personally I'm a big Warren Ellis fan. I I love almost everything he wrote, uh, in in the first place, and it's you know it it's very much in his style in his vein of how he writes. So if if you're if you liked, you know, Transmetropolitan, if you like Trees, if you like any of the any of the other things that he's written over the years, uh, you'd probably be interested in in Freak Angels. I got to um, get caught up on Trees. Yeah, I'm a little behind myself. I, I have only got the first trade of that so far, but uh, very intriguing story to start with. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, speaking of story, we should probably actually talk about what the Freak Angel story is. Yeah. <laughs> since oh, we have and not by the way, that. <laughs> yeah. But before that, uh, the web address is www.freakangels one word dot com. So it's easy enough to find. Yeah. Um, Although I'll I'll point out again before we get into the story, we did have a little problem earlier in the month. Uh, we were you and I were going back and forth trying to you know talk about uh, you know comics that were that we're going to discuss today, and we had some trouble with their website. It was down for about a week or so uh, with no explanation. It seems to be back up and running as of right now, but as a completed comic, I don't know if they're going to if that's a ongoing maintenance issue that they're just not they're tending to or not or whatever but in case you happen to go to freakangels.com and you get an error message that's potentially where that's coming from yeah that's what we were getting last week yeah okay Um, so the story the story yes so uh we're basically it's uh not surprisingly one of his uh post-apocalyptic post-apocalyptic wastelands uh set in uh whitechapel uh new or england and it focuses around the, this group of characters, which we eventually learned to uh, kind of collectively call themselves the Freak Angels. Um, and the city has gone undergone some kind of catastrophe, and it's been flooded out. There's, uh, you know, 20 feet of water throughout the entire city. You can't go anywhere unless it's by boat or helicopter, I suppose. Um, and the these Freak Angels have put together a kind of a a cooperative community of sorts. And basically, you know, here here are the people that have survived whatever this catastrophe is. We're going to try and make a go of it. Uh, And so they're living on the third and fourth and fifth floors of these these buildings that are all flooded out. And um, we're never 
you know, we're we're never quite sure, that we're never told throughout the primary story what's going on. We just know that these people are trying to survive and that the the people in the next town over, you know, they try and uh, defend themselves from the from the you know bandits and and other or people we're not next to- door. We're, we're not told the details at first. Yeah, at, at first, that's what I meant. Yeah. Is yeah. Uh, for the for the bulk of the story, we're not told what what happened beforehand, uh, and it's mostly about them trying to survive. But again, both the like you know bandits and the next town over and whatever, and the interactions among themselves. Uh, you know, they they all have dif- different personalities, very distinct personalities, and they don't all get along. Uh, in some cases, very much not at all. <laughs> so, right. Uh, there's there's a lot of internal strife and conflict going on uh, as these uh, kids basically. They're uh, I guess they're all like they're in their teens and twenties for the most part. Um, as they're trying to survive, essentially a, a cataclysm of sorts. Right. And, you know, we were talking about the mystery, at least in the first few volumes, as to, you know, why London is the way that it is, or why, I guess, Britain is the way it is. Uh, We do eventually get that information. And that's one of the things I really enjoyed about Freak Angels, is that there's enough of a tease there that keeps you coming back, yet you hang on to the story and eventually you will get that exposition. And so you can tell we're dealing with a master storyteller here, Mm -hmm. Warren Ellis, in that he knows how to manipulate the narrative, right? He doesn't give too much information away too quickly. He withholds it in such a way that I wanted to know what happened sooner rather than later, even though I didn't necessarily get it, but I wasn't frustrated by that fact, right? So it's an entertaining story, even if you don't have all of the pieces together yet. And even by the time we get to the end of Freak Angels, the very end, um, there's still one very central question that is left unanswered, and that that's left unanswered with the twelve individuals, these these twenty some olds themselves, and that is why and how did they get the powers that they have, and mm-hmm. they don't know. And by the end of the story, even as readers, we don't know. So, I mean, I don't think I, I wouldn't think that there are any plans for another Freak Angels narrative. But should Warren Ellis uh, in Duffield choose to continue uh, the Freak Angel storyline, they could do so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although, yeah, to your point, it's uh, I don't think I have not heard any in tension to, to continue on it's been more than a few years now and uh from everything i've read you know of of ellis since then he's never really expressed a desire necessarily to go back to this um and i, I hope he doesn't i hope he do- you know not every successful narrative needs to have a follow-up or a sequel and yeah you know, i i i tire uh, easily of the sequel to this or that i mean why continue doing this let it rest um and I'll, I'll even say that for something like, and I'm going to offend, I know, a lot of listeners, Star Wars. Just <laughs> let, let it end, okay? Just enjoy it. You don't need a series of endless you know, sequels. Um, I, I mean, I like Star Wars. I'm just not a big Star Wars fan, so maybe that's why I come across as a little callous here. But you know, not every great narrative needs a follow-up. And this and Freak Angels, I don't think I agree with you. I don't think it needs anything else. Um, yeah. even, even though we still have kind of some of those linger, that lingering question there, um, I, I think it's still a set. It's, it's a satisfying enough read that you don't you're not clamoring for. Uh, you're not. It, it's interesting. I don't think you're necessarily clamoring for more of that particular story, but it leaves you clamoring for more stories of that type. You know, you I, I want to see more. Uh, stories, more fiction of that caliber, and that well done, that well plotted. You know, basically, you know, if we could get an army of Warren Ellis's out there to to do all the writing, <laughs> you know, I, I'd be thrilled with that uh, personally. But like I said, I'm I've been a bit of a Ellis fan for for several years beforehand. Yeah, uh, you know, we we we've discussed this already, or at least you mentioned this and that is the relationship among the 12 people that make up the freak angels. Um, I mean, there is a lot of action in this webcomic. 
But to me, what really drives the narrative is the emotional, personal interaction among these characters, the various relationships that they have set up. And sometimes those relationships consist of... Uh, t- you know, just just two people in how they relate. So, for instance, there is um, uh, Jack and oh, who who is the sex woman, uh, the one who has the harem? Uh, oh yeah, uh, um, I, and I, I should have written her name uh, down. Damn it! Um, I know who you're talking about. I'm Sukar. Sure. Sukar. There you is go. that her name? Yeah. yeah. And and so we learn that these guys have a long past, and we see the culmination or at least the build up of that past together play out in in freak angels but there are other characters where you know a pair has a relationship or two or three interact in a different way and then there are others like for instance connor who is, who stand out as individuals who aren't necessarily linked to one or more characters but it's the interaction among all 12 of these characters even someone that we don't don't see until later in this story, Mark, uh, because he has been cast out. Um, But, you know, it's the interacting of all of these 12 characters, even when one of those characters isn't present, Mm -hmm. that drives this story. It's the drama. And I really enjoyed that. So this is not just a series of, uh, you know, high-octane action explosions. I mean, there's some of that in here as well. Sure. But uh, I think this is much more a personal drama-driven narrative. Yeah, and I, and I think that's that's one of the hallmarks you get with Ellis generally, right? I mean, he's he's very good at writing these characters that are very interesting, and uh, the interactions of between them and among them are the ones that you're you're coming to the story for. Um, but he's not so ingrained in that as to dismiss the 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 action and the excitement of just you know stuff blowing up, right? Um, so. You know, I, I think you can go back to to much of his work, and you'll see those same kind of ideas. Um, and then, you know, I, that's one of the criticisms I've heard of Ellis. In fact, over the years, is that a lot of his work has the same types of themes and and touches on the same types of narratives. Um, and I think this one, uh, Freak Angels, I think stands out even a little bit apart from from the others. I mean, it's still it's still Ellis. It still has his stylistics, his stylings, his his uh, his 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 vision, his uh, way of speaking uh, through through a story. Um, but it seems remarkably different in execution, I guess, than than anything else that I've read from him. And I wonder if, in part, that has to do with uh, Duffield's art, too. As As I'm sitting here looking... I have to point this out. As I'm sitting here looking at the archives, I don't think I noticed this while I was reading it. Every page has a very rigid layout. Either four uh, four panels, two panels, or one panel. Yeah, you're right. Every or sometimes single, three. Yeah, so, very very occasionally three. But there, it's the very solid grid structure throughout the entire story. Right, um, and it it didn't actually dawn on me until I was just reading it here, and it's it's really interesting to see how he's played that out. Um, you know, because you're you're still flowing uh, from page to page. Uh, you know, I don't know if you necessarily notice that. I I suspect it's uh, not dissimilar to the to the thinking that went into Watchmen, uh, yes, only uh, just uh, use just using a different grid. But the right, same idea. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. Um, from what I'm seeing here, every page that, that that Duffield is laying out has as its basis a four panel grid. That 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 kind of layout, you know, mm-hmm. where you have four consistently shaped panels, and when there is less than four panels on a page, for instance, if there are two or three, or maybe even just one, with a full page spread or a full page panel, then 
he's still working within that four page or four panel grid. It, he just combines two. So for instance, if there is, uh, for example, a three panel page, he may take what would have been though that top row of uh, two panels, combine them into one in that second row is two or in, uh, you know, less frequently, if the, there's a case where you have, let's say, two panels that they are they laid out uh, long and, and not uh, horizontal, right? So they're more vertically laid out. He'll take the two panels that would have, of the four, that would have been on the, let's say, left hand side, made them into one long panel and have maybe one of the other right hand panels. Uh, with 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 art and then the other blank you know so there there is no panel but basically he uses what could be a four panel grid as as his basic uh play space yeah yeah and and the other thing i want to point out not related to the um to the the storytelling per se but just as a as an aesthetic um i really like the the visual style that he brings to this um, particularly with uh, particularly with the coloring, the the illustrations are good, very good. Um, but I think what's striking about the series visually is how he approaches color, um, and and particularly uh, what he does with shadows throughout the entire story. He's got this um, uh, very kind of naturalistic color. Uh, you know, all the characters are you know have the skin tones and and modeled backgrounds on the buildings and and camouflage pants and the whole bit but then these shadows are very very stark and prominent almost i i, I want to say comic booky but <laughs> in a in a uh in the sense that you know the in the traditional comic book you know if somebody drew a shadow it was a black blob on the ground right and it was right. colored in solid he does the same thing except Instead of just making it a black blob, it's a darker color of whatever it is that the shadow is being cast on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if it's a pair of tan pants, then uh, then the shadow is a is a darker brown. If it's a, if somebody's skin tone, um, it's a darker shade of that skin tone. Um, and it makes for a very striking visual. Is there are these very very strict hard shadows throughout the entire story. Which contrast a great deal to the 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 very nuanced and modeled uh, coloring that he's got going on underneath it. It's, it's it makes for a very I don't know, like I said, a particularly striking effect visually, um, and one that I don't think I've seen very many people use. Yeah, you know, and I'm glad that you bring up uh, Duffield's art. Now, I really am not familiar with other things that he's done. I know he's done some other work with Avatar, for instance, Absolution, and, and he's done a few other things here or there I, I've looked up. But this is the first book of his that I've read. I really like his art style, and, and I want to ask you if you feel the same. Hmm. Um, do you think that there is a bit of the manga influence in Duffield's uh, uh, style in Freak Angels? Uh, you know, I can. It's not something I consciously noticed, uh, but now that you bring it up, I can see that. I can totally and, see that. Yeah. And, and by that, I, I don't mean necessarily the more egregious kind of cutesy moe eyed uh manga that that that's out there but if i if i see this art in a work of mo- a work published by let's say viz media or vertical or kadancha i wouldn't be surprised it would seem to fit right in uh i, I don't think it's overtly manga influenced but to me there are cases where there are just enough instances where i looked at a panel and i thought manga that that had me asking you know if you thought the same thing yeah, like I said, it wasn't something I consciously thought of before, but I can I can totally see that. Um, and as I'm sitting here, I'm looking at some of the the pages in particular. I think there's there's a lot that stems from uh, his individual panel layouts that are are probably a little more manga influenced because there's a lot more of that kind of talking head. Uh, approach to story, right? We we're, were talking earlier, it's a lot about the interactions of people, right? So there's a lot of piece, 
places where he has to draw basically two people sitting opposite a table talking. How do you make that look interesting? Well, you mm-hmm. can either you can either do it like Jack Kirby and put a fight scene in the middle of it, <laughs> or or you can go, uh, you know, kind of a, a manga approach and and uh, take things just uh, some interesting dramatic angles and focus on the the facial features and whatever. And I think he does more of the latter. Um, the other thing I noticed too is he's got a very uh, light line work, uh, right? The, it's, yes, yes. I think a, a lot of, there, there's still a lot of nuance and subtlety to it, but it's not nearly as heavy as you would typically get in a Western comic. Um, or even, you know, uh, you know, a, a European comic. Um, it's, I, I think it's a, a lightness and a fineness, fineness of line that, uh, that's, a little more has a little more manga influence, uh, Eastern influence on that. Right. And, you know, another thing about the style, and I think this also plays into Ellis's writing as well, and that is this seems to be paced in a way that reminds me more of a work of manga than, let's say, a Western comic, either in the U.S. or in, in, in Europe or Great Britain, uh, in that there seems to be more you know, what Scott McCloud would call, you know, aspect to aspect transition, right? Mm-hmm. And so we have less emphasis of action to action, um, you know, from one panel to the next. But there, and, and at the same time, there is more space visually and literally uh, for um, a sense of atmosphere. To be mm-hmm. created, so there are sometimes a series of panels and even pages that give you a particular feel of location or atmosphere or what a character is experiencing at the moment. You know, you may have an image of a building, and then a, in the next panel, an image of characters as seen from a distance doing something, and then maybe in another panel, a street scene. In other words, there's not much of any action going on, but it helps to set uh, a more solid sense of place. And I think that's something that you're more apt to find in manga or Japanese-created comics than you are in those by Western creators. And there seemed to be more of that in here as well. Uh, I mean, I, and, and that has to do not only with, with Duffield's art, but I, also I'm sure that Ellis's story as well, because he had to say, let's create a scene here. So he's wanting to, at times, slow the story down in order to give it time to breathe, so to speak, to give a sense of place and character and just emotional feel. Yeah, and I, I suspect that was probably the biggest thing that he took away, what Ellis took away from uh, working online versus traditional print is that he felt that he had the space to do that. That's a good you know, point. You know, if you're working in print, you know, a publisher is going to say, okay, that's a great story idea. Let's get that done in six issues or, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, they're going to they're gonna give you some kind of dictum of here's what uh, you have to, here's how much space you have to fill. And uh, with the webcomic, he's got, uh, you know, these six page installments, but he can have an infinite number of them. So, you know, why not spend an extra three or four pages on, you know, making sure that the building is, is very well detailed and, and we know all the aspects of it from top to bottom, you know, why, you know, just having somebody walk through it without actually doing or saying anything, you know, or something like that. He's got the space to do that, which he did not have in print. Right. Uh, now, you mentioned the, the, I guess, the six installments of each of the, and what are they called, um, episodes. Uh, and there are a total of 144 episodes. Now, is, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't each episode was basically a week's work? And mm-hmm. that each episode had six, for the most part, uh, pieces to them, or installments, or pages, if we want to use that word. Right. Uh, and so in each of those six came out during a week, although there were periods where they had kind of a break week and, and they point those out. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm a little surprised they, they've left those online um, because they were, uh, like you said, they were coming out I, I, as once a week and you'd get six install or six pages every week. So it was, mm-hmm. it was more or less daily, but it allowed, uh, Ellis and Duffield to to write the story in such a way that you don't have to have that dramatic 
bullet, uh, bullet at the end of each page, right? So they can they can do these six page sequences instead of a one page sequence. Um, well, you know, I know one of the reasons why they left those interludes up is that it helps them to sell product. And this leads me to something we actually haven't discussed on this episode with the other um, web comics, Femme Noir, It Will All Hurt, and now Freak Angels, is uh, unlike a lot of web comics that we look at for this series, you know, many times they'll have sponsor banners or places for them to, you know, to click through. And, and that's how they help to generate uh, revenue. I don't think any of these comics have sponsors or advertisers at all and i know in the case of freak angels they their revenue i guess that are created by this is the merchandise it's either the hard copy versions of freak angels so you can get the various volumes either boxed or you know one volume at a time uh bags t-shirts mugs um i mean so if you go to the avatar avatar press store uh, sometimes in these interludes, you will find references to these products. Yeah, it was actually it was a interesting um, that Avatar was willing to play a long game with this when it was coming out because um, they knew that they didn't want to solicit the books until they'd at least been released online. Uh, so, right, we didn't see any of the books available until after. However, uh, the first volume was essentially done, however long that took. Um, and it took them a while, too, before they started to realize that it was that it was successful enough and that it was popular enough that people would be interested in, you know, T-shirts and jackets and book bags and, and all that kind of stuff. So they went uh, a fair while at first before any of that was available. Um, and... What I liked about that too is that uh, that they put some thought into into the pieces that they that they put out. They, for the most part, you know, they didn't just say, "Okay, here's a T-shirt with the char- such and such character on it. And here's a T-shirt with this other character on it." Uh, you know, they actually put some a, a fair amount of thought and and design into each of the pieces, and and it all of them kind of come across to me at least more as. Um, Almost the the type of thing that would be would have been created in world, uh, and not not all of them exactly, and not all exactly like that. But but there's more of a sense of oh yeah, that's the you know if you were one of the freak angels, you'd carry around a bag like this, right? You know that kind of thing, which I I thought was an interesting way to approach that, and uh, and like I said, it's, it worked. It was a it was a bit of a gamble, I think, on Avatar's part at that time, mm-hmm. um, and it was something. It was an interesting that they were willing to play that longer game within the, you know, with willing to let Ellis tell his story uh, before just trying to flood the market with a lot of tchotchkes or whatever. Yeah, uh, it, it it it's tastefully done. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, and uh, you know, again, everything about this. Uh, webcomic I really enjoyed the individual characters I mean there's some that really stood out to me more than others I, you know one of my favorites is actually the first character that we see here as the story opens and this is KK uh, and she's someone who has a taste let's say for let's say uh, young guys from other clans um, and but but I think her distinguishing characteristic is she she's really good at building things, um, you know not the group's engineer but uh, she's primarily distinguished by her I guess helicopter that she designs and and flies around and so she does have uh, and she even looks a bit like a, a steampunk I mean there's 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 some steampunk in her character uh, and in fact I, they even describe that helicopter as something. With with the word steam in it, I think don't they? Yeah, well, I think that was part of uh, uh, the original inception was that it was going to be a little bit more steampunky uh, in origin. That, that that Freak Angels as a whole. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and I think that was one of the the changes that that they kind of made as they started getting into it. They started getting, I, I think, they started realizing there was more to the the social interactions. And as he started developing the, some of the external characters or the. Uh, tertiary characters a little bit more. Uh, I think he started realizing that that's where the story was. You know, that's a good point because earlier I said that this 
webcomic seems to have a pretty darn clear trajectory, right? That it seems to me that it, everything was clearly mapped out from beginning to end. But now that you said what you just did, it does occur to me that I guess even into the, you know, getting well into the first volume, there's still a sense of this story trying to find its complete groove. I mean, I, I think that it was in a good direction to begin with, but there are things that go on, let's say, after this first uh, collection, right, the first volume, uh, that is markedly different in 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 its narrative feel than, than when we first enter the story of page one. Uh, you're right. It, it, so maybe this kind of steampunk aspect of it with a focus on KK, because she's focused on less as the story develops and it becomes much more of an ensemble cast. Now, on the mm-hmm. one hand, that emphasis on the ensemble makes sense, right? Because as you introduce new characters, there's going to need to be more story space devoted to each one. So you have an ensemble and right. not just to focus on one or two. On the other hand, you know, he probably may have wanted to focus more on the character of KK, but then found that her relationship with one and more characters, and then those characters' relationships between and among others within the group is what really would, was driving his storytelling. So, uh, so this had a little bit of an evolution as well, I guess. I, well, you know, I, I, I have to imagine that any storyteller that's doing a story this long – uh, is got to be able to change things. Uh, yeah, especially as a web comic. I mean, I think any story changes over time. But yeah. I think you know, as you were mentioning earlier, there's something about a web comic that allows the narrative world to breathe, mm-hmm. to get a sense of itself. Yeah, and I, I think that's uh, you know, kind of to what I was saying earlier, Ellis. I, I think you know, realizing that he had the time to to kind of float around with some different ideas he's and, and spend some time and developing uh, side characters that he may not have considered originally because he's used to writing in a in a six issue format or whatever uh, and he had that time to breathe he had that time to to expand on the space that he had originally planned um, I, I am sure he had a story in mind at some level kind of like a a high level, but then just basically started adding characters and changing details as as he went along, and as he kind of realized, oh wait, I can spend an extra two months talking about just this one little detail here because I can, <laughs> you know. Well, Sean, we have been discussing quite, quite a number of uh, elements regarding web comics on this episode. Uh, a lot to discuss. We started off with Christopher Mills and Joe Stanton's Femme Noir. After that, we turned to Farrell Dalrymple's It Will All Hurt. And then we wrapped up with uh, a very thorough discussion uh, of Warren Ellis and Paul Duffield's Freak Angels. So there's a lot packed into the February web comics episode. So definitely, everybody should check those out. Yeah, all all great comics worth reading. Yes. And something else that everyone should check out is our survey, what we mentioned at the top of the show. Again, if you go to survey.libson.com slash comics alternative, that's survey.libson, L-I-B-S-Y-N, dot com slash comics alternative you'll see a six question survey it'll take you no time at all please fill that out send it in and if you include your email address you'll be entered into a drawing where a couple of months or so from now we're going to pick a lucky winner to get a new whenever we get them comics alternative t-shirt that's How cool be, is that? That's going to be pretty cool. That's pretty Yes. Cool. Yeah. And, you know, you can also help us out by visiting the website of our sponsors. Remember, it's Discount Comic Book Service. If you go to dcbservice.com, they'll take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And, in fact, if you go to their sister company, InStockTrades.com, I haven't checked, but I'm pretty sure you could maybe get your issues of Freak Angels there. So that's pretty cool. Also, okay. check out Just Coffee Co-op. That's JustCoffeeCoop.com. At checkout, use the coupon code COMICS for 10% off of your order. And after you're all settled with your coffee and your comics, get in touch with us and let us know 
what you think of our webcomic series. If you go to the website, comicsalternative.com, you'll see that you can leave us a voice message through SpeakPipe. It's a simple and easy program to use, or you can call us the old-fashioned way. Our phone number is 4153-COMICS. That's 4153266427. Uh, you can also get in touch with us via email, too, if you want to pass along some webcomic links to uh, your favorite webcomics that you'd like to have us take a look at. You can email me at sean at comicsalternative.com. Or you can hit both of us at two guys at comicsalternative.com. Or if you want to just hit Derek, you can just hit Derek at comicsalternative.com. I'm sensing a theme here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're also all over the social media sphere, so you can find us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Tumblr, on Instagram, on Google Plus, on Goodreads, and on Pinterest. We even have a YouTube channel, so we're definitely there as well. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, and you can find every single one of our episodes as well as the reviews and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog. And that's at our website, comicsalternative.com. So a lot of ways for people to get in touch with us. Oh, we try to make it as easy as possible because, you know, that's why we're putting the survey up. We want you, we want to know who you guys are. We want to be able to talk to you. So, you know, we want to make it as easy as possible. Whatever way you want to talk to us, we'll talk with you. Yeah, yeah. Get in touch with us any number of ways, but definitely go to survey.lipson.com slash comics alternative and fill out the survey. We'd appreciate that. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Sean. And we're two guys with advanced degrees talking about webcomics. See you later.